Hey folks, welcome to Mediocre Cover Band Guitar Guy. So it's been a couple weeks, uh, work's been really busy and I haven't had a chance to place any content. That's what the cool kids call it, placing content. So uh, today I'm going to talk about some things as I usually do that I read on social media and it's some things we've talked about before with some things added to it. I guess like salad dressing, I don't know. Alright, so something that's been coming kind of increasingly aware to me is uh, the deterioration of like music scenes and things like that and what people are going through and it's very similar to what we're going through here uh, but there are a few differences in things that we're going through here and things that we shouldn't have happening because we only got a small music community and uh, to see what people are doing to it is uh, not good and um, so here's a couple of things that I read through social media anybody familiar with the fish harvesters demonstration at confederation building uh, realized you know, or you may realize now that they got what they were looking for when they, they did the whole thing and they got it because they stuck together and uh, they didn't back down. Something that we should do in our little music community. You might say to yourself, well, what does Fish have to do with music? Well, a local musician made a comment on Facebook that said, what do I have to do? Go up to the Confederation building and slap a few horses on the ears. Apparently, they bought horses in for crowd control and somebody hit one of the horses. Uh, but that's not why they got what they were looking for. They got what they were looking for because they stuck together. And that's something that lacks in our community is sort of a stick to when it comes to helping each other. And uh, that's something we all need to get better at. And uh, the other thing was something I read today, and it constitutes money again. Uh, but the other guys like to have to, you know, slap a horse on the ears to get a fair gig rate. And um, because they were playing for the same money for the last like 20 years, I've been playing for the same money for almost 30 years, so don't feel bad, dude. Anyway, um, the other one was a sort of hypothetical scenario. You can check it out on my Facebook page and read the whole thing. It's really long, but it's a good read. Um, and I'm not asking you to follow or like anything on it. It's just there to read if you want to look at it, because I'm not going to ask people for things anymore, because apparently that's not good when you ask people to subscribe to your channel. Um, so I'm just going to leave it alone and not ask. Um, or if you ask for people to follow you, not, not doing it now. Uh, anyway, but anyway, it, it follows a situation where a venue asks somebody, uh, how much is it going to take to get you to, um, you know, play here to do, come and do a show. And the guy gives them a quote of $5,000 and the venue wants him to predicate the whole reasoning uh of why five thousand dollars and then it goes through a whole story uh where the venue actually realizes that they're not paying enough i guess you know so uh after reading that a few things in the conversation i had last sunday talking about all this stuff uh and it was on un totally unrelated to those two stories i realized that there are a lot of problems in both communities that sort of might need to be addressed and, and unfortunately, in my own community here, a lot of people aren't going to see this video because I have 13 subscribers out of 800 and some odd um, that are from this province. And, uh, you know, that's that's cool. A large portion of my subscribership, that sounds like something a cult leader would say, uh, comes from the United States of America, which is really cool. I'm like beyond stoked about that, you know, mm -hmm. considering where I am, where I grew up and the scope of where I am and like the whole music community myself, that's pretty awesome. But there are things that are hurting our music scene right now and just simple things like nepotism, you know, um, bands that are being put together two months before a festival and given the main stage of an annual festival with guys that have never played a gig before because they have an aunt or an uncle or a parent who sit on a committee or are part of the municipal government or whatever, or, they're getting thrown on big uh, stages because their father is, uh, you know, in the Senate. 
uh, things like that. Uh, not working hard at all for shit, you know. Um, the other things are, uh, we just recently had the Newfoundland and Labrador Winter Games where an individual who has a government job, who's actually the um, executive director of uh, Recreation NL, had his, um, his, his uh, production company play the opening and closing ceremonies of uh, the Winter Games. Um, and I thought that was a bit odd because if you're in that position and you own a construction company and that construction company got hired to build infrastructure for those games, then Patty Daly's open line on Monday morning would be filled full of, um, you know, first time caller, long time listeners, uh, bitching about it and, uh, talking about it and how unfair it is to the other companies. And I'm not saying this in, in earnest to say that I want to have my own band play there. Yeah. I'd love to play on some of these stages, but apparently according to, uh, one of the musicians here, Kids don't want to listen to bands uh, with members that are old enough to be their dads. So what do you do? We're not going to get those gigs. It's a young man's game now. And um, anyway, the whole thing, I'm probably going to be calling a lot of shit out on this one because I'm a little bit angry and uh, about some of the shit. We're frustrated. A little frustrated. Angry is just so, it's just so hostile, right? But anyway, um, there are, like I said, nepotism, those, those sort of things that roll down the hill people who have connections get on all these big stages and they don't do anything else and uh iceberg alley like all the local uh you know supporting acts we have to call them supporting acts now they're not openers anymore because that's demeaning they're supporting acts okay um a lovely gentleman a lovely musician a talented guy and a very passionate music um educator here in newfoundland by the name of adam baxter made a comment um wondering why it seems like all of the supporting acts are uh, from the city and they don't consider bringing anybody else from anywhere else in. Uh, a very well-known musician here in our city who's made it nationally, made it fairly large nationally, uh, had a very valid answer. He would know about these things because I'm sure in his early days they did a lot of support acts themselves uh, as their group supported a lot of bands is what I'm trying to say. And he would uh, have a very informative answer, not an opinion, but an actual knowledgeable answer. And he said, it's about doing business. And this is correct. I would agree with that. It made sense. Uh, it's about drawing in the, the, the biggest chance you have to get people to get down early as opposed to only coming when the headliners are playing, right? The, the bigger artists. And um, I thought, you know, that makes sense. But then I thought about it. None of these guys are doing business, though. What, they're playing three shows a year at, like, the Rock House and the Black Sheep for the Door. They're not doing any more business than anyone else. In fact, they're probably doing less business than a lot of other people when it comes to that. Because we got guys that are doing original music that are playing every fucking week. But they're not part of the Little Darlings, right? You got to be a part of that Little Darlings Club. And that goes in with the nepotism because you got that in. We've all got a connection and we've all said to somebody, Hey, is there any chance you could uh, point me in the right direction to get into this venue? And there's nothing wrong with that. Somebody, I get messages. I used to get messages when we were playing all the time. How do we get here? Who's the contact here? And, and you give them a phone number. You give them, what, an email, you know? Because you want the scene to thrive, right? And if it's good for one, it's good for all. So then there's the entitlement factor now. But a lot of the young kids that have been given through nepotism and through their connections, like, you know, big gigs. And then when they don't, it's like, well, why well, I, I haven't played Iceberg Alley in like three years or four years. It's been such a long time. Why can't I play it all the time? Because I'm so fucking adorable. It's not how it works, okay? It, uh, it, it does. It is how it works. So, But you just weren't lucky this time around. They swapped you out with some other darlings, okay? Um, and then the entitlement goes along with the coattail riders who came in on the backs of parents with political appointments, um, or you have a relative, a brother who's already been a somewhat famous musician, and you live off of that fame, and then your entitlement goes into getting gigs and thinking that you're the shit, you know what I mean? You're this big star because you're, you know, what I like to call a five-minute celebrity. You do your gig, and then you go to the bar, and then for five minutes, everybody's like, yeah, you're so awesome. Uh, but you didn't work to get where you're to, and you walked over a lot of people that were working their way up the chain, right? Guys that were doing gigs in warehouses, 
because it paid. You're doing a warehouse grand opening, right? Been there and done it. And it was one of our first gigs. Um, playing in a, in a warehouse, you know, racking. Set up next to you. My amp was like right next to racking, you know. Concrete floor, forklifts parked over. And we played a full night. We played three sets in a, in a warehouse. But well, we got paid. We got paid well. So that's good for a first gig. Um, then we'll go with the coattail, or not the coattail riders. We'll go with the, the fucking gatekeepers we were talking about early. Like, these guys are really doing a number. We had one individual who played a club who's, the club is no longer around. It closed last November. Um, shoddy management, yeah, that definitely played a, a factor in it, you know. Um, unexperienced management, I guess. But one individual had three bands going in there and hauled 37000 By our calculations, if his, what he is saying he got paid in that bar, and it came from very reliable, credible sources, if he did get this money, he hauled $37,000 out of this bar in less than a year, and not just him, but the bands, okay? So the three projects he had going hauled $37,000 out of a bar, they did not create $37,000 worth of income for the bar. No. For the, that just, that's just a break even. They should have been able to create more money so there was some profit there for the bar to make money and stay open, but they didn't. And he wasn't the only one that was doing this, kids. There were a couple more people who were in that same scenario. I think there was one guy at one point playing in seven bands that played that bar. And, well, he played other places too, don't get me wrong, but that bar, they were there all the time. Um, there's a lot of lazy musicians around too. They book gigs and then they cancel them because they want to go hang out with their friends or they want to go to somebody's party and things like that. That's just not right. That's also not respecting the gig. And that's another thing you need to do and respect the gig. Respect the crowds that are coming to see you. You know, don't make fun of people because they're Bayman. A Bayman, for those of you who don't know, is somebody who lives like outside of the city. They live in a, in a, in a place that you got to drive four hours, you know. Uh, to get to the city. We call them Bayman here. I don't know what you guys call them uh, anywhere else, but that's what they're here in Newfoundland. Don't make fun of, you know, don't don't shit where you eat, I guess is the thing. Um, if, if somebody's good enough to hire you, like have respect for the gig, the venue, and the people that are paid to come see you. Uh, we got that individual uh, who last year yelled at people at venues and told them to get the fuck out. Like he played uh, um, Shamrock City. Telling a story about one of the songs that he wrote about a mini bike, and um, yes, a grown man wrote a song about a mini bike. Uh, people got disinterested and started having a conversation because you're in a pub also that serves as a restaurant. Okay, you're aware of that when you took this gig, and people are probably going to say things like, "Hey, man, how's your food? How's your beers? You know, do you want something else?" Flips the shit, man. Like loses his absolute mind, yelling at people, telling them to shut the fuck up, and then tells them if they want to have a conversation, go down to Green Sleeves. Really? You kick them out of a fucking venue you don't even own? Really? So let's put this scenario in. Uh, you got somebody in fixing the toilet in a stall. Somebody comes in and decides they're going to sit in the next stall and drop a deuce. You don't like the fact that they're doing that. You're a plumber. You go and bang on the door and say, hey, you got to go down to green sleeves and take a shit. You think the fucking venue is going to have that guy back? But no, the venue has this guy back all the time. And he did it again. He sent... A young woman out crying in tears. So those people aren't going to come back to that venue. You lost customers. But you don't care because he's part of the little darlings and a coattail rider. See how it all starts to fit in? And is wrong. You're disrespecting the audience. You're disrespecting the venue. You're disrespecting the music. Thank God it's only Irish stuff. Anyway, as I said, it's frustration. Uh, you're disrespecting everything. Okay. And you don't, at that point, you should be blacklisted. If anybody else in the city did that, they'd be blacklisted, right? They wouldn't be getting sympathy. They wouldn't have comments like, he only did right there, he's trying to earn a living. No, he's not, because he got other things on the go, and he's got money. He's just doing this to stroke an ego, and when his ego uh, kind of got bruised by somebody not giving a shit about what he was talking about, he took a temper tantrum like a fucking six foot six three year old right? That's what fucking happened. Let's call it what it is, okay? But those people aren't going to go back to the venue that hurt the venue, but the venue didn't care. They're going to have him back because he's one of the St. John's famous darlings. Probably wants to have him on the fucking uh, NL Walk of Fame. Who knows? So there's disrespect, coattail riding, like all in one in that situation, right? And 
it, you know, then there's the venues, man. Holy fuck. There's a few things that I've come to realize in a conversation that I had last Sunday. We're all a part of the problem. Okay? Every one of us are on par with creating this issue. We're playing venues that don't pay. We're saying, yeah, okay, we'll do a gig for 600 bucks. That's 150 bucks a man. And then complaining about it after and saying, well, we're not getting paid enough. And I've got friends that are probably watching this right now. I'm going to entail what goes into that $150 that I'm getting for a gig, okay? First of all, we have to go in the afternoon and do sound check with the sound guy. So you're already taking time out of your day. For me, if we're doing a two-nighter and we're doing something on a Friday night, means I got to get off work early to get sound check. Okay? I'm lucky. I can get the flexibility to do so. Some members in our band don't have that flexibility. Okay? So we end up doing sound check without a member sometimes. It's it's okay. We usually have the drummer myself and and Tammy the vocalist. Usually it's, you know, Perry sometimes can't get the sound check. And uh, we understand, right? But it's hard. It, it really is. We can't do it on the fly. And they want you They want you to do it in, you know. And then in one of the venues we played, they had karaoke. That started at like 6 o'clock. So you had to have it done by then. Then you go home after doing your sound check. You're back to the venue at 10 because we start playing at 11. We don't stop at 11 like some places. We start at 11. We play from 11 till 3 in the morning, two half-hour breaks. If you're doing a two-nighter, like I said, when you do the first gig... You can leave your amp and shit on the stage and go home. I take my guitars. Uh, you go home and you get your, your sleep. You get up on Saturday. You're all foggy. And then 10 o'clock at night, you're back at the venue again. You start playing at 11. You finish off at 3. And now you got to break down. It's 4 a.m. when you walk out of the venue. You get home at 4.30. Your Sunday's pretty well shot. So you've given up all this time. Uh, I know Perry, our bassist, goes to work after gigging on Friday night. But he understands that this is what he got himself into, and he wants to play and doesn't complain and does the gigs and goes to work. There are times when I've gotten off at stage at 3 on a Saturday night and had to be to work at 6 in the morning. Uh, still, even at this age. But what happens is people don't see that, right? The public perception is that we're doing this for fun. But we do it. We agree to do it. And if we stop doing it, then we take some of the control back. And going back to that first post about do I have to go up and slap a horse on the arse to get fair gig rates? No, but we do need to stick together. Uh, we uh, Somebody made a comment about maybe we need to put an organization together to guarantee certain rates. That's not going to work. Venues won't they'll find a way around it, right? It'll be all duos and that. But here's some suggestions that I'm going to just come up with here now, and it's not going to be popular with the guys that do music for Facebook statuses uh, to show everybody they went to high school with 40 years ago that they're cool now. Um, if you can't afford to hire a band, don't advertise to hire a band. There's a thought. And maybe we should turn down those $600 gigs, Okay. And then what happens if we turn down those $600 gigs? Maybe they might turn into $700 gigs. Who knows? If the bar can't do it, then they have to go find another alternative. It's not about bragging rights. It's not about patting yourself on the back and saying, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. What about the guys that do this for a living? You're taking money out of their pockets. And as I said a million times on this channel, and I probably said it already here tonight, they're trying to put food in the fridge and clothes on the kids pay their bills like the rest of us. And it's no good to say get a real job because it is a job uh, and we're working hard. The amount of time that goes into learning stuff on these things or drums or whatever you're playing, basses, keyboards, you're playing like the spoons or you're playing the triangle in a metalcore band, it takes a bit of work. And it takes work, more work and more learning than a lot of guys that are actually professional tradespersons. So, yes, it's a job, and some guys go to university and get music degrees. The dog finally woke after his walk. He only does that in the videos, right? So, anyway, maybe we need to start taking power back by doing that or saying no to shitty venues. Anybody here remember playing Darnell's in Paradise? I do. 
wasn't fun. Uh, he was a tangly old bastard. Anyway, guys, that's it for me. The dog's going to start barking. Love you. Thank you for the support. And uh, see you next time.